a class. In this video, we are going to start a new session, our patient. Our patient is another very common use diagnostic method that we use in our clinics. The population in Chinese medicine has two categories. One is the, the information that we are going to introduce here in this video. The other part is for is the pulse diagnosis. The pulse diagnosis is one of the most typical and very special diagnostic methods from Chinese medicine because of the, the contents. There's a lot of information in that session. So we will use another slide to talk about the pulse diagnosis specifically. In this video, we're going to introduce, we're going to have a very brief introduction on the palpation. And then I will show you some videos. Most of the contents in this video, you're going to learn in the diagnose, in the Western medicine diagnosis, diagnostics. So we're not going to focus on here, but just give you a brief image. What's palpation? Palpation is a method to diagnose medical conditions by touching, feeling, or pressing the patient's skin hand, feet, chest, abdomen, and or at your point. So that's the from the practitioners, the practitioner use their hand to feel on the patient. What's the while performing palpation, the patient can be either seated or lying, depends on the area that you you need to palpate. And also depends on the patient's condition. You just need to choose which position is better for your palpation, and also the patient can feel comfortable. Touching the method gent gently contact the skin with the palm and fingers to examine. So the difference from Chinese medicine, what we focus on is the feeling the cold heat, this kind of feeling. So although the, the way to perform the palpation is same as the way to perform in the later video you can see from the Western medicine, but what we try to gather the information from is the, the feeling of the coldness, the heat or the dryness. And also from the other parts, we also going to focus on the local sensation, shape, texture, size, or the smoothness of the lungs. So this, so the palpation in Chinese medicine is actually the combination of the palpation in Western medicine plus some signs that we, we are focusing on Chinese medicine, such as the, the the feeling of the temperature or the sensation. Pressing, the practitioner applies a heavy pressure on the fingers. And percussion, percussion is also very common use, especially to identify what's underneath the skin. The direct percussion, fixed. Palm percussion. So in this percussion, the practitioner will put one of one hand on, on the assessed area, and the other hand with an empty fix, an open fix, knock on the hit old hand. So you're going to see from this one. So this finger finger percussion, the fix. Palm percussion is the practitioner will put the palm on the skin on the assess area and the other hand will be an open fix. The fix is hitting his old palm. The finger finger percussion is the practitioner use the finger to hit on his finger. You will see from the yeah. That seems normal resin to me. You should have dullness over the heart. 
So as you can hear, that's how from the percussion you can feel different sounds underneath, such as the sounds from the lung or from the heart, even from the abdomen, they all got different sounds. So in future, you're going to study in the Western medicine diagnostics. Also, we're going to practice in in the clinics in future. By rep percussion, that's the we also have one one video. You can see the direct percussion afterwards. So direct percussion, the physician taps on the assessed area directly. When we perform the our patient, we need to be careful that we need to choose the appropriate position, the suitable or to make the patient feel comfortable. Also, it is important that position is easier for you to palpate. So we need to choose the appropriate palpate method and the appropriate light that's the requirement from the consultation room. Our patient often starts from the healthy area, the affected area. So you need to see, you can feel the normal area first and then to feel the, to palpate the affected area. The force, gentle the force, gradually increase for increasing. So you don't use very excessive excessive force directly. So that's need to be careful. And also from the physician side and from the patient side, we need to discuss, we need to explain well to make the patient feel relaxed, not nervous. So there's some skills in the communicate in the communications. And also, it, when we perform the palpation, in the meantime, we're going to focus on the patient's expression, such as if you feel something or you when you press the feet, when you press, the patient feel pain. Then the, this kind of pain, the patient may have special or may present with special facial complexion or facial expression then you will pick up the signs or the notice from the patient. During the palpation, we also will combine with the diagnostic method of inquiry, such as you will ask the patient, do they feel something discomfort? Do they feel pain? Or how severe the pain is? So this kind of conversation also will happen during the palpation. Our patient will give us a direct clinical data from the access area, such as the, the nature of the disease the location. We're going to give you a very quick and brief introduction on the area that will need to be palpated. Palpated, and afterwards you will see some videos on the palpation. Palpation can happen in the head and face. Palpation also need to be performed on from the nail, especially in infants. Palpation on of the eyes area. On the eyes area, you need to be careful. That's the the force you need to be gentle. Patient of the neck, the nodules, goiter, the carotid pulsation is the veins and arteries in the neck area. So that's also for inspection and palpation. The airway, the chest and ribs area. Our patient of the breast, should this physical exam examination become necessary, 
special quaternary notes should be considered. That's especially for a male practitioner to a female patient. So ideally, there will be another weakness, such as the sister standing around, standing next to you to observe the, the whole process to avoid further debate. So we're going to, if necessary, we're going to focus on the lo location. If there's some like knot or lymph, the location, area, depth, the shape, the size, what's the texture, the number, how many. Does the move, can you move or not? Operation of Shudi. Shudi, this is a Chinese translation. This is the specificity in, in Chinese medicine theories. That's because, because this area is the area where the heart beats you can feel. So we can see from the heart function from here as well. This Shudi, the palpation here, is the same as the area apex beat. So that would be very similar to the Western medicine. You just put, sometimes you put two fingers or your whole finger, whole pounds in the area on the fifth space. The fifth rib space. The ribs there at the moment you're going to see, you can see it in the video. And the rest are different palpation that we you can perform or you can experience in the clinics. So what we focus on the temperature. Does the patient feel pain? What kinds of pain when you press? Does the pain relieve on pressure on pressure or does the pain aggravate on pressure? For the sores and ulcers, normally we don't palpate. If you have to, you can palpate around, not on the source or ulcer. The palpation on the skin also needs to be careful if the patient we have, if the patient has skin disorder. Palpation of the back and the lower back. This can happen for some conditions, also can happen, can be the diagnostic from at your point on the back. Here's a short demonstration on how to palpate the head and neck. So, we have the uh, pre-auricular lymph nodes that are here. We have the post-auricular lymph nodes that are here. We have occipital lymph nodes that are present back here. We have the posterior triangle lymph nodes that are present here. We have the submandibular triangle lymph nodes that are present here, submental lymph nodes, and then the internal jugular chain lymph nodes that are present palpating deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. I will now demonstrate to you the proper technique for palpation. This can either be done from an anterior approach or a posterior approach. Uh, both As you can see from here, this, this practitioner has shown us the different area to palpate. And before he palpates the patient, he feel, each, he feel itching on his face and he scrape on his face. Please be careful that this is not allowed to happen in our practice. If you feel itching, if you, if you touch your face, you have to wash your hand again before palpate patient. Okay, so this is a mistake. Are uh, acceptable. So we first feel for preauricular lymph nodes, postauricular lymph nodes, occipital lymph nodes. I'm using the balls of my. Uh, thumbs here to feel. Then we can do the internal jugular chain lymph nodes first by feeling for that anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoid muscle 
and then palp in insinuating our fingers and palpating deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle to feel for those uh, to feel for those nodes. We have the posterior triangle lymph nodes that are present between the anterior border of the trapezius muscle and the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Down here are the supracavicular lymph nodes and then the infracavicular lymph nodes. We can also palpate the thyroid gland uh, 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 in the midline. Again, we take our finger, roll it up till we feel the, the, uh, the uh, cricoid cartilage. Below the cricoid cartilage sits the thyroid isthmus, and we palpate. I can insinuate my finger then between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trachea and try to feel the right thyroid lobe and similarly the left thyroid lobe. If we do, if I did feel a mass in Brittany, I would give her a glass of water and have her drink. As the tracheal, the laryngotracheal apparatus will move superiorly and inferiorly as she swallows and because the thyroid gland is attached to the laryngotracheal apparatus and if that mass were originating from the thyroid gland, it should also move up and down. So, This is the demonstration on how to palpate the thyroid. Thyroid examination. Examination of the thyroid gland starts with inspection. In doing so, it's important to consider the gland's anatomy and its surrounding structures. The thyroid cartilage is a helpful landmark since the thyroid can be palpated bilaterally below it. In healthy individuals, the thyroid only weighs around 18 to 25 grams and should not be visible. An enlarged thyroid, otherwise known as goiter, is considered class 2 if macroscopically visible. When the head is reclined, thyroid enlargement can be seen even earlier. Palpation is usually performed from behind, although anterior palpation is also feasible. The gland is often only detectable upon palpation if a pathology is present. 
such as nodules, enlargement, or an altered consistency. You should also note any tenderness to touch, as seen in inflammatory changes, such as a viral infection. To assess the mobility of the thyroid gland, ask the patient to swallow and offer a glass of water if necessary. If thyroid perfusion is increased, like in Graves' disease, examination may reveal an auscultable brute and a palpable thrill. Here is the demonstration on breast examination. Hi, I'm Simon, one of the junior doctors. Can I just check your name and age, please? Yeah, it's Leola and I'm 23. Nice to meet Leola. So today I need to perform a breast examination. Have you ever had one of these before? No. Okay, and which breast is of concern to you? Um, I felt a lump in my left breast. Okay, so what this examination will involve is me having a look and a feel of the breast tissue. Are you happy for me to go ahead? Yeah, that's fine. All right. What I'll do is I'll let you get undressed, so taking your top things off, including your bra, mm -hmm. and then popping this gown on to cover up. In the meantime, I'll fetch one of the nursing staff to act as a chaperone throughout. Okay. All right. Okay, Leola, if you could just put your hands on your hips for me, and now just press down on the hips. And now if you could put your hands behind your head, and push your elbows back. And now just lean forward for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, Leola, if you could lie down for me now, I'm going to examine the breast. And if you could just put your right hand behind your head for me. Thank you. I just want to make sure that there's no discharge from the nipple. If you could just squeeze your right nipple between your thumb and index finger. Okay, thank you. If you could just switch the hand behind your head. Thank you. Now could you just tense your chest muscles, Leona? Thank you. What I need to do now is have a feel of the glands in your armpit, okay? So if I could start on the right, I'll just take all the weight of your arm, so just completely relax it, okay? Okay, Leola, I'll do the same on your left side now. So again, just relax, let me take all the weight. I'm just going to have a feel of the glands in your neck now, all right.
That completes the examination. Thank you very much, Leola. I'll just leave you to get dressed now. Thanks. Today I performed a breast examination on Leola, a 23-year-old lady. On inspection of the right breast, there was evidence of nipple ulceration and there was erythema in the lower outer right quadrant. On inspection of the left breast, there was evidence of nipple retraction and also peau d'orange in the left lower outer quadrant. On palpation of the left breast, there was a firm craggy 3 by 3 centimetre mass at approximately 2 o'clock. It was located 4 centimetres from the nipple and it appeared to be tethered to the underlying tissues. There were no other lumps on palpation and there was no lymph node involvement. For completion, I would consider further examinations to detect the presence of disseminated malignancy. I would arrange ultrasound scan and also core biopsy. And this is the examination from abdominal area. Abdominal examination. Abdominal examination begins with inspection. Abnormalities such as distension, scars, stretch marks, hematomas, and engorged veins can provide the first evidence for conditions involving the abdomen. The abdomen can be separated into individual regions to more precisely depict anatomical location. A classical distribution consists of four quadrants that are separated right from left by a single vertical plane and superior from inferior by a horizontal plane. Another common scheme divides the anterior abdominal wall into nine anatomical regions. As part of this distribution, the upper, middle, and lower abdomen are separated into thirds, these regions enable more specific findings during examination. In contrast to examining the chest, auscultation of the abdomen should occur before palpation. Otherwise, stimulation of the bowels may trigger a false increase in peristalsis. Bowel sounds are physiologically heard as clicks and gurgles in an irregular pattern. Hypoactive or absent sounds can indicate a paralytic ileus resulting postoperatively or from a condition like peritonitis. Hyperactive sounds may indicate gastrointestinal infection or trying to overcome obstruction, which could imply a mechanical ileus. Besides bowel sounds, an aortic brute due to an aneurysm or stenosis may be auscultated at the upper umbilical area. Listen for possible renal artery brutes bilaterally from this area. Assessing percussion sounds is helpful in determining the size, position, and density of abdominal contents. Solid organs, fluids, or tumors lead to dull sounds that may sound similar to percussion sounds of the thigh. In contrast, the percussion sound of hollow, air-filled intestines is more drum-like in nature and is therefore known as tympanic or tympanitic. Tympanitic sounds are even more extreme in conditions involving the accumulation of excess gas within the bowels, as seen in abdominal bloating. A distended abdomen has various causes, including adiposity, bloating, a tumor, or ascites. In addition to percussion, being able to form a belly fold may help in determining the cause. Physiologically, the examiner should be able to form a small belly fold. In contrast, in patients with massive ascites, it would be difficult or not possible to do so. The most reliable clinical sign to detect ascites is checking for shifting dullness. If a patient with ascites is lying supine, fluid accumulates in the flank regions, leading to dullness on percussion. At the same time, the air-filled bowel loops are forced upwards by the free fluid due to buoyancy, resulting in tympanitic percussion. To locate specifically where dullness shifts to tympani, or the air fluid level, percussion should be performed from the sides towards the middle. To confirm that the dullness is caused by ascites, ask the patient to switch to a lateral decubitus position. If ascites is present, the air-filled bowel loops will shift accordingly and remain at the surface of the fluid. 
As a result, the air fluid level will shift as well. This is known as shifting dullness. Palpation should be conducted last. It can be uncomfortable for some patients, causing them to tense up. To help relax the abdominal muscles, you can try distracting patients with a conversation or asking them to breathe deeply. To prevent the patient from tightening the abdominal muscles, otherwise known as guarding, it is important to begin palpating at a point far from any painful areas and to avoid using cold hands. Begin by shallowly palpating the surface. Doing so may already elicit involuntary guarding that could indicate peritonitis. Pay attention to the patient's expressions, such as flinching, as they may help in interpreting pain. Now continue by systematically palpating deeper to assess the abdominal organs. Take note of any pressure pain, rebound tenderness, or abdominal masses. Palpating a normal-sized liver is sometimes difficult. It usually extends beyond the rib cage in the area of the right midclavicular line and traverses the epigastric region. Even in this region, the liver can only be felt through deep palpation. Start the examination by asking the patient to exhale. Afterwards, as the patient is inhaling, slowly slide your fingers towards the right rib cage so they are near the liver's edge. When the lower liver edge is felt, its surface structure, consistency, and size can be evaluated. Since a severely enlarged liver can extend as far as the lower abdomen, palpation should start further down in the right lower quadrant. If necessary, bimanual palpation can help locate the liver in patients with a larger abdominal diameter. Another possibility to determine the size of the liver is the scratch test although its reliability and precision remain controversial. One method is to place the stethoscope on the chest just below the xiphoid process. Lightly scratch the abdominal skin in the right lower quadrant with a fingernail, parallel to the expected liver border. The air-filled bowel loops under the fingertip poorly transmit the sound waves to the stethoscope. Proceed with the scratch test by gradually moving cranially towards the rib cage. The transition from bowel to liver tissue, through which sound waves can travel more intensely, is notable for a sudden increase in loudness of the scratching and marks the lower liver border. Continue the scratch test further upwards until a sudden drop in loudness is observed, marking the transition from liver to lung. This is where the upper liver border is located. In this patient, percussion, palpation, and scratch test reveal a physiological liver size. The craniocaudal length of the right liver lobe in the midclavicular line is around 10 centimeters. These examination techniques can help in examining a suspected hepatomegaly, but do not replace the standard clinical practice of abdominal ultrasound which helps assess the liver more precisely. Assess the gallbladder next, which should only be palpable in a pathological state, for example, if hydrops is present. Palpation takes place somewhat medial to the midclavicular line below the right rib cage. Evaluating for tenderness on palpation is important since it may indicate cholecystitis. Cholecystitis can also be evaluated by testing for a positive Murphy's sign. To test this sign, first ask the patient to exhale while palpating the gallbladder area medial to the midclavicular line. Now, instruct the patient to take a deep breath so the gallbladder is pushed down and against the examiner's fingertips as the lungs expand. If cholecystitis is present, the patient will experience a sharp and sudden pain causing an abrupt halt to inhalation. This reaction is known as a positive Murphy sign. The spleen is generally not palpable in healthy adults. A pathologically enlarged spleen is palpated under the left costal margin during inspiration as the inferior edge descends to the examiner's fingertips. 
If an enlarged spleen is already suspected, palpation should begin further down. The examination may be facilitated by gently lifting the left flank of the patient ventrally. Percussion of the kidneys, located in the retroperitoneum, can also be done on abdominal examination. Keep in mind that the upper pole of the left kidney can be found at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. Because of the liver, the right kidney lies around 3 centimeters lower than the left. Careful percussion of the flanks in the lower rib cage area should not elicit pain in a healthy patient. Pain on percussion, however, should raise suspicion for a pathological process, such as... So this is the direct percussion. ...pyelonephritis or urolithiasis. So these short videos are the demonstration on the common palpation that we begin to perform in our clinics should become necessary. And in the next video, we're going to start the pulse diagnosis. Thank you for your attention.